Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. And today, we'll talk about food insecurity in the two largest states of our union, Texas and California, with Food Bank Chief Executives, Eric Cooper of San Antonio Food Bank, James Floros of San Diego Food Bank, and Brian Green of, Houston, of the Houston Food Bank, one of the country's largest food banks. And a reminder to Zoom attendees that we will take three snap polls during the show and we'll announce results and questions submitted through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen will be included in our discussion. So thank you all for joining us today. I'm so excited to talk about food insecurity because it is a real dire situation in our two states. It's a dire situation in the United States and it's going to likely uh, get worse with the continued uh, economic stresses that we're facing. So we, we looked up to, uh, to sort of summarize the problem in, in Tex Texas and California, and about one in seven Texans and one in six Californians live with food insecurity. And with the current economic crisis and pandemic, as, as I said, those, like, uh, those numbers are likely to grow, to grow. What are you seeing on the ground in your community, Eric? How are you confronting the situation? And, and how is your staff, your board, and your volunteers uh, um, acting in this time of need? Well, thank you, Mark. You know, what we're seeing isn't all that much different from many of the Feeding America food banks throughout the country. Uh, Pre-COVID-19, we fed about 60,000 people a week, and uh, that number jumped to 120,000 people a week in this COVID crisis. Uh, we've been expanding, really working to try to understand and meet the unique challenges that families have in this crisis. Uh, we, we primarily serve a network of partner pantries, um, some of them run by seniors, and so uh, about 30% of our pantries close just because uh, the fear of catching the virus. Uh, those that stayed open pivoted to um, a curbside type of pickup so they could um, serve families by appointment. And then what I think many people have seen through the media is pop-up distributions or mobile distributions that really create a contact or touchless environment uh, for families to come and get food. And so it's those long lines and those parking lots full of cars, unfortunately, that, that many Feed in America food banks have seen. And that's definitely the case here in San Antonio. We have this very humble, hardworking river walk economy. And uh, many of those families that were living on the edge, a paycheck away, uh, were now pushed over the edge and seeing themselves uh, getting food from the, from the food bank. So uh, James, Eric has seen an increase of about two thirds from 60 to, you said 100, 100 Eric? 120,000, so double. 100, 100, double. Are you, James, are you seeing a, a doubling as well in your area? Or, or more so. Uh, before the pandemic, we estimated about one in six, one in seven San Diegans were termed food insecure. That was about 450,000 people. And we were feeding about 350,000 people a month. And then pandemic hit and it what seemed like almost overnight we went from feeding 350,000 people a month to nearly 600,000 people a month. Uh, you cannot make this up. Um, you know, we have a distribute like Eric and like Brian, we have a very robust distribution model, 200 distribution sites that we control plus a network of 500 nonprofits. And it was crazy. But you know we're a completely local organization uh, serving San Diego County. It's kind of in our DNA to pivot and adapt. And so within 72 hours, we had phase one of our response in place. Now we're on phase three and looking now at phase four. Uh, so you know we went from maybe almost half a million people that are food insecure to maybe a million people who are, don't know where the next meal is coming from. And Brian, you're the big Kahuna in in this uh, group. You've got a huge, huge challenge. <laughs> You have a huge challenge there. What are you saying? Well, it's very, very similar. So COVID is first a health crisis, but it is also an economic crisis. And that's where we try to have our impact. It's also become, as you know, an education crisis. Okay. There's so many other ripple effects of this. And what we just saw was it was almost like dropping a curtain as soon as the closures happened. Uh, where so many families who were just a paycheck away from not being able to not only think about 
the food, but can they pay their rent? Uh, can they handle any of the other expenses? It was it's one of the weird ironies um, that when, as uh, soon as the unemployment numbers shot way up, um, the average or the median wage also shot up because the people most likely to be laid off or have a very significant reduction in their hours were generally the lowest paid people. And those are also the people who don't have a safety net. Uh, and so we saw that manifest all around the country immediately. And we're still dealing with that now. It's, it's down a bit. Uh, and that's the good news is the economy is getting better. We are seeing the line shorten. They're still way above where they were before. So I'll just put this in pounds standpoint. So we were doing about before the storm about 450,000 pounds a day. Um, at, um, in the first four months, uh, we had shot up to over a million pounds on average per day. Wow. Uh, we're down to about you know 800,000 pounds. Now that's not just a reflection of how long the line is. Uh, you know, it's also what resources we can manage to find. But I mean, it's just crazy figures and it just goes on and on and on. You know, it's, it, you're, you're making an, a very important point. You know, there's, there's the old saw about their, their lies, damn lies and statistics. Statistics capture a certain, uh, a certain type of information, but there's information that's off the page, right? And what you're saying is that, you know, if you look at median income and the median income is shot up, you can say, oh, well, we're doing well. Median income is, sh is shooting up. But when people fall off the page, what happens there? And, and you see that with the stock market, right? The stock market is going up and people with, with assets are becoming wealthier. But the people who are providing direct services in restaurants and so on and so forth, those are the people who end, who end up winding up at your food bank, right, Brian? Yeah, and, and so... Uh, certainly, the uh, the government interventions have have helped significantly. I, w without question, the stimulus checks, the the enhanced unemployment, and absolutely the enhanced SNAP. Um, but it's it hasn't been equal, and there have been many households that have been left out, and for many households, it's it's not been enough. So the aggregate statistics really do leave out uh, a lot of people, and it is one of I think all, all three of us are you know one of our greatest fears is there as we've especially gone to this contactless mode of, of operating where we're not even talking to people as much because, oh, they're behind these barriers. They're supposed to, when they drive by in their cars, they're supposed to keep their windows up even. Um, we don't know how many people we're leaving behind or how many people we're not reaching or what we're doing is simply inadequate. Um, and I really are worried about the long-term consequences of that. Are you all finding that there's a shift for, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the people that are coming up are you finding it's it's more families um, or or more young people? Are are uh, is your mix of clientele uh, changing, or is it the same clientele just more? Uh, James, what are you finding? Well, I mean, uh, San Diego is a big service industry, right? So I mean, you know, hotels, uh, conventions, you know, restaurant community, and there I think were hit the hardest, and they were you know immediately laid off or furloughed. Um, many of them tried to get unemployment benefits, but then there was a huge lag. Then some started getting their unemployment benefits. Then the restaurants and everything opened up for a while. Well, then we went to you know code red and we shut back down. So they stopped getting their unemployment benefits to go back to work. Now they're laid off again. Now have to reapply. And then, of course, we're seeing that people don't have that $600 a week augmentation to their unemployment. So we saw a, a, a spike, kind of flattened, and now it's starting to go back up again. And Eric, what are you seeing? Are you seeing the same kind of uh, pace in San Antonio? Yeah, you know, very similar to what James mentioned. I mean, San Antonio is a, a, an incredible hospitality industry, um, lots of conventions. And so um, those lower wage workers got hammered. And, you know, it's interesting, as Brian talked, he and I have been at this work for a long time. And in the, in the 90s, there was a lot of unemployment, right? Um, but the last few decades of who food banks are feeding are really the working poor. I mean, they're, the, the employment has been good, uh, just families were not making enough. And, and now in this COVID environment, we're seeing unemployment at this, at this high that I think has brought in, um, you know, higher socioeconomic families to the lines of food banks or traditionally higher socioeconomics. About 50% about of who we're seeing uh, have never had to ask for help before. I mean, these are, these are families that 
don't know the emergency food system. They've never applied for SNAP. For many of them, they don't actually qualify for SNAP because uh, their car in Texas, uh, there's an asset test. So their, their car is worth more than $15,000. So that automatically keeps them from getting that incredible safety net benefit. And so it's those families that are relying on the food banks. I'd say we are trending a few more seniors um, you know, those, those highly vulnerable populations uh, that, that lack access, whether, you know, that barrier of technology, um, transportation, or just extreme fear of the virus has caused them to reach out and see if they could get uh, potential uh, groceries delivered to their home uh, by us or, um, or maybe a meals through our, our great partner organizations, Meals on Wheels. We just finished a poll that basically um, asked people um, what their impression is of the attributes that determine um, issues with, with food insecurity. And the two issues that, that rose to the top was employment and uh, housing. Are you finding, Brian, that, that uh, the employment uh, piece, particularly because we are finding that people are living so at the edge, is as much of a determinant um, as it might have been in the past. Are we basically employing people so much at the edge that they slip into food insecurity um, when there are issues that, that arise that, um, that give them a little bit of a blip and they have no ability to absorb that blip? Yeah, I think Eric had a really, really good point. When, when we started so many years ago, three decades ago, um, I would say most of the people that we serve uh, were unemployed. Um, that's not true anymore. For some time now, the, the vast majority of the people that we serve are people who have jobs. Low wage employment has become our biggest issue in America. And food insecurity is just, it's the manifestation of poverty, of the larger you know, poverty picture. Because food is the flexible expense. You can't pay 90% of your rent. You can't pay 90% of your utility bill. You can pay 90% of your food costs. That's, you know, that's what drives people you know, to us. And actually, I'm, I'm a little bit worried, um, you know, as, as America is seeing this picture of, oh, this is what hunger looks like. And well, it's just telling people, the problem is, is it's, it's telling people actually kind of a, a misleading narrative because right now, yes, unemployment is really driving a lot of what's going on in those lines. That's not normally the case. It's really low wage employment. And that low wage employment, the, the issue is not just the, the day to day, but it also makes them so much more vulnerable to any shock, just as Mark, you, you pointed out. And we're absolutely saying that. I will put, add one more thing. Statistically, the, the greatest indicator for food insecurity um, in a household is young children. Um, you know, the, the, you know, having young kids, kids are more likely to live in food insecure households than any other demographic. Right. You know, just to add to Brian and Eric's comments, I mean, so many people also were employed, but they're living paycheck to paycheck. So they're one medical emergency, one losing a job or what have you away from uh, poverty. And then there's a whole other underlying layer that these two gentlemen know very well is that even when families are feeding their, uh, their children, they're not able to afford healthy food. So now you start seeing another layer to the impact of poverty, poor academic performance, poor health outcomes. So it's not just enough to just feed people, but there's a nutritional value that's really important as well. You have tra yeah. trauma stacked on trauma, right, Eric? Yeah, Mark. I mean, you, you nail it. I mean, I think income, housing, and healthcare, uh, probably what we see uh, as, 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 as just big offenders. I, I, I do think that, the, um, that food tends to be the greatest subsidy. Um, I mean, people substitute between paying their rent or buying food. And I think for many families are getting food from their local food bank so that they can pay their rent or they can, you know, pay their, you know, healthcare costs. Um, but as Brian said, I mean, it's really, it's the low wages. I mean, that ultimately was manifested in these long lines. I mean, I think that, uh, that food banks knew that uh, we're serving the working poor, that they were a paycheck away from a crisis. And it was usually car breaking down, you know, hospital bill, you know, maybe divorce, a loss of job occasionally, um, but they weren't prepared for COVID-19. I mean, this significant health crisis has put so many more families now 
in the lines of food banks. So it's, it's going to take a, 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 a long time period, I think, to get the economy strengthened, but we have the opportunity to do it right this time, I think, to address the wage uh, inequality um, and, and really try to strengthen this, this uh, economy so that uh, we're not as vulnerable um, in the future. How do we deal with this? You know, when, when you look at global trends and you have the fact that businesses can move anywhere in the world and the lowest wage uh, that uh, markets are absorbing so many jobs, how do we deal with this? Because it seems to me that, that we have a systemic issue that has just been laid bare by the pandemic and the economic crisis that has ensued. But I think you've all said that, that we've got a working poor issue. Right? We have people who contribute to the welfare of us all, the economic vitality and health of the United States under normal times, yet we treat them in a way where they, they are uh, at a marginal um, area where, you know, car breaks down, you need to swap out your brakes because your brake pads need to be, um, um, have, have no more uh, grip. And all of a sudden, you're not eating as well because of that one minor expense. How do we deal with that? If we raise wages, do the jobs go away? Um, Brian, why don't, why don't you give it, a, give it a shot? Systemic, you know, a small problem here. How do we deal with, with the working poor, the food insecurity of the working poor? Well, thank you, Mark. You're kind of hitting a, <laughs> a topic where there's a lot of us uh, in a very a rapidly, I think, growing number of us who are saying, look, we will never food bank our way out of hunger. Right. Um, uh, back, back in the old days when Eric and I were, were, young, were younger doing, doing this, we actually thought that was feasible. You know, there's so much surplus wasted food and, you know, that, oh, you just got this food to the people who need it. It's not working. Uh, we're helping, but the problem is actually getting worse. And it's, a, and it's a function of low wage employment. And what do we do? So first off, I, you know, I really do think that every short in the line strategy we can do, we need to be doing. And, you know, it's like the people having as much as possible the skill sets that lead them to the better paying, more sustain, you know, sustainable living jobs. Ultimately though, that, that itself is still not, is still not gonna be sufficient. I mean, you think of so many of the jobs right now that we, uh, in the, those uh, middle skills jobs, you know, that we're so focused on as with the, with the rise of AI and robotics, what's gonna happen to so many of those, of those skill sets? Um, so ultimately we have to start to confront that we are a rich society. And we're going to get significantly richer over the next 30 years. And the question then becomes, all right, is there no way that we can actually run an economy effectively that doesn't provide, you know, so that everybody who's working is able to make, you know, a, a living wage for their families? I just, I just don't believe that's not feasible. Um, I do think that if we were to just plant a flag and say, do this, we're going to lose half the population, no matter which solution, direction, solution we go. And I do think that, you know, we need to kind of, hit the conscience of America to say, let's figure this out together. Let's not start with some preordained you know, conclusion, but say that we don't have to be a society where somebody can't take care of the needs of their family. We just don't have to be that anymore. What do we need to do? It seems to me that there's a basis for these discussions. We have here represented the two largest states of the union. You know, one is viewed as being very blue politically. Um, one is viewed as being very red politically. But they, they have the same problems. It's the exact same problem. It's not as if, as if one system has got the thing licked. I mean, how do we, how do we deal with the, with the tremendous diversity, the political diversity, the, the divisions here? Is it really just a matter of us sort of talking to each other about the problems that we all have in this community? Because we do share so many... Uh, common issues, uh, James. You know, you're you're the guy from California, so well. You know, you I got I, I got painted blue, so I will tell you that uh, if we're a blue state, we still California has some of the highest rates of poverty um, in the nation, and uh, so we have that. You have maybe a legislature that's more open to that, but yet such huge. Uh, uh, high, high level uh, of uh, cost of living. There's so many other factors that really fit into to all this. But, you know, we get equal support from both sides of the aisle. And sometimes the right side of the aisle actually gives me more support than even the left. And, and the left's been pretty good. The one thing, one takeaway, and I'd be interested to see what these guys have to say about because they've been doing it a little longer than I have. I've only been doing it for seven years. When I came to San Diego County, 
what I saw was, is to Brian's point, they were everybody saying, we're going to end hunger. Ending hunger is our goal. And then everything they were doing is, was about building a better mousetrap and be, and ending hunger is not being more effective in feeding people. You know, ending hunger is about root causes of poverty and why people are hungry in the first place. And that is a very challenging and slippery slope because if somebody could have cured poverty, they would have done it, you know, centuries ago. Uh, but that's really what we're trying to push for. And I'm sure these guys are doing that as well, promoting healthy children, uh, education as, as a major vehicle to break the cycle of poverty. But it is very complicated. You, uh, Eric, do you have uh, a silver bullet to, to fix this, yeah, this fix all Eric. problem? Fix this. I tell you, well, I think going back to the question, it's not that the pie isn't big enough when you think of the economy. I think it's it's how it's allocated. And I think if if we want to get to the to the equity conversation and, and how can we you know, ensure that there aren't losers, but that everybody wins. And I think there needs to be some some, you know, common good um, strategies around healthcare. I mean, the fact that that healthcare is, you know, on the stock exchange doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But um, I think that these social goods of education and healthcare can can mitigate a lot of what impacts the households that we provide food to. Um, education has to be a, a big part of the equation. Um, you know, I think the COVID environment is teaching um, that there's there's online access, and so the opportunity for higher ed to maybe take on more students. I mean, the expense would be minimal to allow everyone to go to college, right? Um, if everyone's going online, let's, let's, let's better educate our workforce so that we can be more competitive in the global economy um, and, and, and let all boats rise in the harbor. Um, I do think of our strategies in San Antonio as three-tiered. I mean, we, we really focus on food for today and that's our immediate emergency food through our pantries and our programs. But really it's our food for tomorrow that connects families to public benefits, more household stabilization strategies like SNAP and WIC and access to healthcare through Medicaid or um, you know, long-term care for seniors. But then it's our food for a lifetime work that as Brian said, that's what food banks are doing when it comes to shortening the line. I mean. How can you help create access to, to, to meaningful, sustainable employment through job training, um, you know, job placement, uh, just, just conversations with, with these families around how to ask for a raise, how to negotiate a raise. Um, ultimately, it will be about the wage that they're making if they can sustain themselves in any economy. I, you know, James is out there in California where everything costs a whole lot more than they did in Texas. <laughs> And, yeah. and, and it's just a, it's, it's, it's a different environment, but uh, uh, you know, we, we've got to come to the table and I think uh, the partisanship across America, um, you know, has to stop. We've, we've got to just unite on these basic issues if we're going to move uh, our, our, our communities forward. You touch on so many different issues. You talk about education, you talk about the whole idea and, and this is really appealing to me, the idea of, of changing our attitudes and perhaps taking a, a cue from some of our uh, uh, philosophers, our humanists, our religious leaders, where we're basically redefining the idea of sacrifice into the idea of sharing. You know, maybe we all have to share a little bit more and care about people who might need us to adjust our attitudes, right? I mean, the, the fact is that that we have to start seeing America as one, not as you versus me, not, not, not I keep mine and, and uh, you figure it out, because that's not working, is it, Brian? <laughs> um, yeah. I think it, as you were talking about just the, the division, the red state, you know, blue state, I mean, I grew up in California, been in Texas now for uh, 15 years. Man, it's just, we're not that different. And uh, I think James had a really good point about you know, food banks. We, we get to see that where we have just thousands and thousands of supporters um, who, you know, have different political views and they come on both, both sides of the aisle, but they're all sincere. Yeah, they don't want to see this problem. Uh, and then there's the people that we serve um, who, the, you know, do they understand what these people are going through? Do these people understand them? And it's like, God, how do we bring these people together? Because I think their differences are so much less than people make them out to be. Um, 
It's just the details of solution, you know, not the sincerity of wanting a better world. That you know that that, that you know, where where we are, which is which is why I really do think that, um, you know, the divisions that we're just solidifying in our country right now are just so toxic and it's like so unnecessary. Um, in, in this sort of like Texas California rivalry, sort you know sort sort of thing is like ah, it's so meaningless. <laughs> yes, it is. It, it is really meaningless, isn't it? I mean, if you took everybody who is in a food line. Um, in Texas and put them together with everybody in a food line in California or New York or Illinois or Kentucky, they would all stand in the same line or be in their car socially distanced and they'd all be having the exact same thoughts. And those people who are supplying the foods, uh, those people who are part of your supply chain and part of your, your volunteer core, they would be having the exact same thoughts, wouldn't they? Yeah, no, I, I I tend to think of it that uh, a little Brian hit on it. We're not going to food bank our way out of this. Mark, you're talking more philosophy. I think, you know, in my terms, we're not going to solve hunger with a canned good, right? It's it's really about you know bringing people together. It's about building an increased uh, amount of compassion, um, and and with that compassion, understanding. Um, because that's where the conversation has uh, opportunity to to really, you know, when I think of food, it's bringing people together. And I think food banks have been so privileged to, to see or to sit in the crossroads between those that have and those that don't have. And so understanding starts to come. And I think if more people understood uh, those basic needs, they, they'd be motivated uh, to want to create equitable situations. Uh, they, they, they would want to provide health care. They'd want to provide a, a more sustainable wage um, because, you know, they see us as, uh, you know, people as family, right? It's, it's, man, you really, you need to take care of, of, of these families. And I think um, it's a privilege to be, to be useful, to serve. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of transformative powers to, to serving and giving and sharing um, that makes us all better. And I think the transaction of, giving and receiving has, has been powerful to witness in the COVID environment. We just completed two polls, one where we asked whether we should increase taxes over the next 18 months in order to help uh, in this situation. 64% said yes, and uh, almost 30% said, I don't know. Um, so you see here a, a willingness of about 90, 93% of, of taking that kind of a move, an increase in taxes in order to help with this issue, with 94% with saying that we should all contribute more. So you have this consensus that is building around different types of approaches to funding solutions, at least for the short term. But to, but to create a sustainable uh, approach that perhaps doesn't solve the problem of hunger one and once and for all, but reduces it, particularly amongst our working poor, James. Don't you think that, that we could get together and, and start experimenting a little bit, taking some of the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, red state solutions, applying them in, in a blue state, taking some of the blue state solutions, applying them in a red state, and not really caring which part of the freaking color spectrum it, it's in, but, but instead let's solve some problems, right, James? Yeah, we're sure shooting for purple, I guess. You know, I, I think hunger needs to be a, a bipartisan issue. Um, I'm sure, you know, if, if Texas is a red state, they still get a tremendous support from the left side of the aisle. Uh, I just keep my mouth shut and my head low and try not to get caught in the crossfire. Uh, I have seen a little bit of partisanship and uh, jockeying on how to spend available funding and all that. So it is, it is very complicated, but I think it just gets back to the, the root causes promoting education, promoting health, access to health care, promoting um, access to housing. I think those three things really are at the root of a solution. How do we get there? I'm not even sure. And Brian, why don't you take us out? How do you, how do you see this, um, this evolving in a place like Houston where you have such an enormous need and you have such an enormous set of services. I mean, you, you have one of the most sophisticated operations in the United States. And, and how, do you, how do you change the dynamic in such a huge market? There's the Houston market, there's the Los Angeles market, there's the New York market, those, 
those major, major urban areas where there are also a concentration of need and a lot of people in service industries who are out of work, how do we make a dent? Because we, we have to make a change. We cannot let this crisis go unexploited for solutions. So the, the first thing that I, I think is very important for us to recognize is that hunger is a function of poverty. Um, and therefore, thinking that, you know, that we need to be talking about solving hunger by itself is nonsense. Um, if, we did, if that was feasible, we'd have done it. Um, we're a resource. We, we definitely reduce suffering when, when we're doing this good. But what we've also found is that we have people in, in an effective economy, which Houston absolutely is. It's an amazing place. Um, but they're, they're all different perspectives, and they, they agree that they don't want to see the circumstances. So it's talking to America about, okay, this is about poverty. This is about poverty in a country that is way too rich for this to have to be the case. And my own board, which has very much Republicans and, and, and Democrats, unanimous, they, they've agreed that our biggest goal needs to be not needing the food bank. And they know that that's not me, that that's because it's about poverty and it's about not just, oh, how can we you know, help with a job program and things like it, those are good. But ultimately this is about how our economy as a whole runs. And then fostering that, that conversation um, to basically re, kind of restructure um, you know, our politically, political economy. And it seems to me that in order to reach some sort of a solution, we have to ourselves, who are fortunate, try to inhabit the space of those who are your clients. Instead of trying to figure out the solution from the point of view of the person who doesn't need the solution, <laughs> let's figure out the solution from the point of view of somebody who does need the solution today. And that's, and that's actually, it's so simple. Uh, I, one of the things that amazes me is you hit, hit you, your, your point about you know, the, the, the person who doesn't know the experience, you know, saying, oh, well, this is what you should do. Uh, no, um, there's, there's stuff that you don't understand and, and, and in both directions. Um, but how people that, you, that seem so hard on one side or another, um, given some opportunity to, you know, to, to kind of see the other side in, in experience, people change their minds surprisingly fast. This isn't as hard as we think it is because people are you know, so entrenched, but they don't, they're much more willing to not be entrenched than I think it is. I know our time is short, but one of the things I've seen during the pandemic is people are now discovering uh, food banks and the good work that we do. And maybe they didn't really think about it because they thought we were primarily feeding the homeless. I have like 24,000 new donors. People have never given money to us and they were pretty substantial gifts. So if there's a silver lining here, people now uh, really appreciate the good work of a food bank and how important we are. Well, James Flores, Brian Green, Eric Cooper, thank you so much for sharing the experiences of San Diego, Houston, San Antonio. You have wisdom. Thank you for sharing it with us. That's the Nonprofit Report. Attendees, thank you so much for being part of this show, and we'll see you on Thursday.